بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith In our last two episodes we had discussed ten factors that are necessitated when we claim and testify Muhammad Rasulullah Today we're going to talk about two factors that go against, that contradict our testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah, the first one is to trivialize the Sunnah and belittle it, and the second one is to add on more to the Sunnah, even if that's with good intentions. Stay tuned for today's show. In today's episode, we're going to discuss two factors that go against the perfection of the testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah. In other words, if these two factors are committed, then the person who does them doesn't really and truly testify with his heart and soul, Muhammad Rasulullah. The first of these factors is to trivialize the sunnah or to claim that we don't have to follow it. So if someone were to claim, I don't have to follow the Prophet wasallam, in reality he has negated and nullified his testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah and in fact he has left the fold of Islam, realistically speaking. Because he doesn't believe in Muhammad Rasulullah. If he says, I don't have to follow the Prophet Wasallam. I don't have to follow what he said, then in reality he is not a Muslim. However, this is not that common amongst Muslims. There is a belief that exists which is similar to this and is a stepping stone to it. And it is a very dangerous belief. And that is to trivialize it and say, I only have to follow the Quran. It's not in the Quran what you're saying. I don't have to turn to the Sunnah. And this belief is a stepping stone to what I said previously. And it leads to it. The way to refute this belief is to show that the Qur'an itself refers to the Sunnah. In over 40 verses in the Qur'an, Allah commands us to follow the Sunnah. In one verse, in Surah Nisa, verse 80, Allah says, مَن يُطْعِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ Allah." Whoever obeys the Prophet has in reality obeyed Allah. Obedience to the Prophet وسلم, is obedience to Allah. It is an integral part of our iman, of our faith, that we must obey everything that comes from the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, in a beautiful hadith, in Sunan ibn Majah, if you can hand it to me, volume 1, Sunan ibn Majah, there are a number of traditions regarding the importance of following the Sunnah along with the Qur'an, and that we cannot only take from the Qur'an. And one good thing about uh, Ibn Majah is that in the beginning of his book, he talks about the entire introduction is about the importance of following the Sunnah. In one such narration, he says that the, the Prophet ﷺ said that there will always be a group of my people who are going to be following the truth. One group that always is following the truth until the Day of Judgment. He was asked, who are they, O Messenger of Allah? He said, they are those who follow my Sunnah and the Sunnah of the Companion. In another narration, he said, and this is a very beautiful hadith, listen to this. He said, it is possible that a person will come in later times, a Muslim will come in later times, who will lie back on his couch. In other words, he is going to show a sign of arrogance. And he will be narrated a hadith of mine. And he will say, I don't want to hear hadith. Between us is the book of Allah. I only want to hear the Qur'an. Whatever I find in the Qur'an, I will make it permissible. And whatever I find in the Qur'an, I will make it impermissible. In other words, everything that's in the Qur'an, I'll believe it. But I don't need the Sunnah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, know that everything I have made haram is the same as if Allah has made it haram. Whatever the Prophet ﷺ has prohibited, it is as if Allah has prohibited it. And whatever he allows, it is as if Allah ﷺ has allowed it. 
In another famous story, Imran ibn, Imran ibn Hussein, the very famous companion of the Prophet وسلم, was narrating hadith to his students. After the Prophet's death, وسلم, the companions would narrate the hadith to those after them. So a man came to him and he said, O oh Imran, don't narrate to me any hadith. I only want the Quran. Don't narrate to me anything from the Sunnah. So Imran said, come closer to me. He came closer to him and said, let me ask you, if I were to leave you with the Quran, would you be able to tell me how many prayers there are in a day? If I were to leave you with the Quran, could you tell me that Dhuhr is four rak'ahs and Asr is four and Maghrib is three? If I were to leave you with the Quran, could you tell me that in Dhuhr you have to recite silently and in Maghrib you have to recite loudly in the first two rak'ahs? If I were to leave you with the Quran, could you tell me how much zakah charity to give? And so on and so on he went. Until finally the man understood that in reality, without the sunnah there is no Islam. Understand this point. Without the sunnah there is no Islam. If a person rejects the sunnah, he has rejected the five prayers. Where does it say in the Quran explicitly to pray five times a day? It doesn't say so explicitly. Where does it say the number of rak'ahs and what to recite and what to do? Hardly anything. And the same applies for every single aspect of this religion. Islam would not be complete without the sunnah. This shows you the error of those people who say, we only have to follow the Quran. As for the sunnah, it was preserved 200 years after the Prophet wasallam, many centuries after he died. I don't know whether it was preserved or not. I'm not sure if it's authentic or not. Such a person, in reality, is an ignorant person who has no idea of the sciences of hadith the sciences of the prophetic traditions and the amount of care and efforts that the scholars of the past exerted in order to protect the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. In order to refute him, you have one of two ways. You can either go into extreme detail about the history of the preservation of the sunnah and there are books in English, many good books in English about this topic. But that is beyond a small conversation and even the scope of our lesson today. There's an easy way to refute him, a very simple way. It will take only a few minutes and every Muslim who is really a Muslim, who has Iman, he must follow it immediately. And that is very simple. You state, my dear brother, Allah has commanded us in the Quran to follow the Sunnah. And we know for a fact that our religion of Islam would be incomplete without it. We don't know so many things just from the Quran. And we also know that Allah will preserve this religion. He will not allow it to be corrupted unlike the religions of old which were corrupted. So, if we know that we must preserve the sunnah in order to preserve the religion, therefore this means that Allah must have preserved the sunnah or else the religion would have been lost as well. It's a very simple logic. You claim that Allah has said He will preserve Islam. You know this. It will remain till the day of judgment. And we also know that Allah has commanded us to follow the Prophet ﷺ. How could He command us to follow the Prophet ﷺ if His sunnah were not to be preserved? How can he command us to do that which we cannot do? How can he claim that Islam will be preserved and yet half of it, the sunnah, will be corrupted? So this requires a very simple common sense and it also requires faith or iman, that you really believe in Allah as your Lord. If you believe in Allah as your Lord, then you will follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah and you will believe that it has been preserved. Now it is beyond the scope of this talk to discuss how do you consider a tradition to be authentic? How do you consider it to be weak or whatever? These are the scholars of hadith, you leave it to them. As for us, we know that there are six famous books, Bukhari and Muslim, and these two are all authentic. And then you have Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, Nisa, Ibn Majah. These are the ones which are usually 90, 95%, 99% authentic. Most of the hadith are authentic. And we have other books as well. We've used some of them in this episode. The point is, if you're in doubt, go to the scholars of hadith and ask them which hadith is not authentic and which hadith is. But the fact of the matter is that they have the capability to tell you what is authentic and not. And that which is authentic is the preserved sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So the first point which goes against the testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah is to trivialize the sunnah or even to claim that it has not been preserved. To claim that the sunnah has not been preserved, you are claiming that Allah has not preserved the religion. To claim that I don't have to follow the Prophet ﷺ, you have rejected Muhammad Rasulullah. So this is the first aspect that goes against our testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah. We must believe that we have to follow the Prophet ﷺ and that has, has his sunnah, everything we need to know, has been preserved in the most minutest of details.
The second aspect which goes against the testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah is to add something to the religion. The first was to trivialize, to try to kick it out. The second is the exact opposite. And that is to believe that the sunnah is insufficient, is deficient. You need to add more acts. The Prophet ﷺ didn't give you all that you needed to know. And this is called an innovation. An innovation. In Arabic, a bid'ah. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim that whoever does any deed which we have not done, which upon which we have not done, then it will be rejected of him. Whoever does any deed that we have not agreed to, meaning that we haven't done it, it hasn't been performed by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it's not found in the Quran, then it will be rejected. In another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, and this is in Sunan al-Nisa'i, hadith number one thousand five hundred seventy-seven, he said that every single innovation in the religion is a bid'ah. Every and any innovation, he said, every innovation qualifies and constitutes a bid'ah, and every bid'ah leads to the fire of hell. Every single innovation leads to the fire of hell. There is no innovation which is a good innovation. Some of the scholars, they try to categorize innovations into good or bad. But the Prophet ﷺ himself stated every innovation is, is an evil innovation and is a bid'ah, and every bid'ah leads to the fire of hell. The whole point of innovation is that you think Islam is incomplete. You have to add something. You might have a good intention, realize. You might think that what you're doing is good, but your intentions don't count here. Your actions speak louder than your words. By adding something to Islam, by claiming that, oh, this is a good act, even though it's not in the Quran and Sunnah, you are claiming that you know better than Allah and His Messenger. That they left something out of their religion. That you came along 1,000 whatever years later and discovered something that they didn't tell you. So this is the implications of a person who innovates. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ in the most severest of terms has cursed and warned against those who innovate. If we turn to, for example, uh, Sunan ibn Majah, if you can give me, oh Sunan ibn Majah, it's already here, excuse me. Sunan ibn Majah, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has refused to accept the deeds of any person who does innovation until he leaves that innovation. He refuses to accept any good deed. This is hadith number 50 in Ibn Majah. He has refused to accept the deeds of any person of innovation. Someone who is innovating, his actions will not be accepted from him until he leaves that innovation. We need to take a short break now. We'll be right back to talk about this concept in more details and also give you some important examples. Stay tuned. <laughs> Prophet ﷺ have informed us that we should not obey no one on the account of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the superiority is to Allah's command. So the husband tells his wife that I want you to check hands with my colleagues, with my business partners. No, even if it means to divorce. If the husband says to his wife that you have to party with me, with partners and so on. No, you have to take your hijab off. No, by any means communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your language and he will be very happy to answer your prayer. we were talking about the evils of innovation and we mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that whoever innovates, whoever is practicing innovations, then his good deeds will not be accepted from him. In another hadith in Bukhari, he said that Allah's curse and the angels' curse is upon those who innovate. Because an innovation is an implication, a testimony that you know better. You know what's right and Allah and His Messenger didn't tell you what's right. They didn't do their job. A'udhu Billah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't do his job properly. He didn't tell you all you need to know. Therefore, you come along so many centuries later and you fine-tune it or you add or you subtract. No. Islam is perfect. The Quran and Sunnah is all we need. We don't need anything else. To add or to subtract. And bid'ah is usually adding. Because you add something which is not found. Is an implication that you know better. There's a hadith that we quoted in our previous episode of the three people that came to the Prophet ﷺ. And they said that, oh, 
whatever the Prophet ﷺ is doing, we can do better than him. One of them said, I will fast every day. The other one said, I will uh, pray every single night. The third one said, I will not marry women anymore. The Prophet ﷺ got angry at them. Their intentions were good. They wanted to do good. But they transgressed. They went beyond the sunnah. He got angry at them. And the same was the case with the companions. They too would get angry when they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah being transgressed. Uh, Akhi, if you can hand me volume 4 of a Tirmidhi, we're going to look up a very interesting uh, tradition regarding the response of the companions. How much the companions also were eager to protect the Sunnah. Jazakallah khair. This is volume 4, page 501, where it is narrated that Ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah ibn Umar, was sitting in the masjid when someone sneezed. Now when someone sneezes, what, what, you, what does the person say? Alhamdulillah. He says, Alhamdulillah. This man, he said, the one who was sitting next to him, he said, Alhamdulillah, wassalamu ala rasulillah. He added something. Okay? Now you would think this is very trivial. What, did, what was Ibn Umar's response? He said, and I also say Alhamdulillah and may Allah's peace and blessings be upon Rasulullah. I also say this. But this is not the time and place to do so. This is not how the Prophet ﷺ taught us. He taught us that when we should sneeze, we should say Alhamdulillah. That's it. Subhanallah. Look at this tradition. Beautiful. What did the man do? What evil did he do? He didn't do any evil. He just said Assalamu ala Rasulullah as well. May Allah's blessings be upon the Prophet ﷺ. But he did something above and beyond what the sunnah told him to do. His intentions were good. His intentions were pure. But intentions alone is not sufficient here. You have to stay restricted within the sunnah. Don't go beyond the bounds. Ibn Umar, as soon as he saw this, he rejected it. He said, I too say assalamu ala rasulillah, but not at this time or this place. And yet another uh, tradition, if you can give me Musnad of Ad-Darimi, now, Musnad of Ad-Darimi is a book written by Abdullah ibn Abdurrahman Ad-Darimi, who died in the year 255 Hijri. And in reality, it is a very beautiful book. Uh, he was actually one of the friends of Imam al-Bukhari. He was one of the friends of Imam al-Bukhari and Imam al-Muslim, even though he was slightly older than them in age. There's a beautiful tradition here. And please, please pay attention. This is a beautiful tradition. Hadith number 210. It is narrated that, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud was once sitting outside of his house when Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, both of these are companions. Abdullah bin Mas'ud is more senior, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is younger. When Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came back from the masjid and he met Abdullah bin Mas'ud at the door of his house. Uh, he, he went up to him and he said, I have just seen something in the masjid that I didn't like it and I came to immediately to ask you. So he said, what did you see? He said, this is Abu Musa narrating to Ibn Mas'ud. He said, I saw in the masjid a group of people sitting in a circle, waiting for the prayer to start. Each one would have some date palm seeds in his hand, or some stones in his hand, some date seeds, or some stones in his hand. And they would say, the leader amongst them would say, say Allahu Akbar 100 times. Then they would say 100 times using these stones to count. Then he would say, say La ilaha illallah 100 times, and they would do the same. Then he would say, say subhanallah 100 times. And they would use these stones, okay, while they're sitting in a circle. And they're waiting for the prayer to start. Once again, they're doing something, dhikr-wise, it's perfect. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, ilaha Allah. But it's the fashion, it's the manner they're doing it in. The Prophet ﷺ never did this. He never sat in a large circle with his companions. They're, you know, doing, uh, counting with date palm seeds or with stones or anything. Or before the prayer doing this. He never did this. So what was Ibn Mas'ud's response? He said, did you not tell them to count their evil deeds while they're doing this? Evil deeds! While they're doing supposedly good deeds, he said, didn't you tell them to count their evil deeds? Then he stood up and he rushed to the masjid. And he said, woe to you, O nation of Muhammad wasallam! How quick are you to destroy yourselves? Here are the Sahaba still alive. Here are the companions still alive. Here are the Prophet's clothes. They have still not decayed. Here are his instruments. They're still available. The instruments that he would use, they're still there. And yet you are so close for destruction. So they said, O oh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, we only wanted to do good. He responded, and how many people intend to do good but don't achieve it? They intended to do good, they wanted to sit and do dhikr of Allah. But not in this way, follow the sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ told us what, how to do dhikr. 
The Prophet ﷺ told us when to do it and, and what is the best way to do it. Don't go beyond the Sunnah. And then he said, Ibn Abdullah Mas'ud, he's telling them, either you are more guided than the companions, and these people were not companions, either you are more guided than the companions, or you have opened up a door of destruction for yourselves. And the hadith goes on and on. But the point is that, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud told them there's only two options. Either you know better than the companions, or you have opened up a door of destruction amongst yourselves. Even though what they were doing, just remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it was the manner and fashion that they were doing it in. There is one example that many might consider controversial. Yet it is a very important example to quote. And that is the example of the mawlid, of the milad, of celebrating the Prophet's birthday sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is an act which there is no ayah behind it. Nor is there a hadith to prove it. Nor did the Prophet sallallahu himself ever do it. Nor did any of the companions after him do so. No one of the pious predecessors ever on the 12th of Rabi'ullah or any other day celebrated the Prophet's birthday. Therefore, this is enough of an evidence to show you that this is an innovation. You will say, but what is the big deal? I'm only trying to show my love to the Prophet ﷺ by doing this. The response is what Ibn Mas'ud said. How many people want to achieve good, but don't achieve it? You're doing something that the Prophet ﷺ never did, claiming that you love him. Yet, in this very act of yours, you're implying that you know more than him. Why didn't he tell us how to do it? When he told us that I've told you everything you need to know, why didn't he tell us this? Why didn't the companions, do you love the Prophet ﷺ more than the companions? More than Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali? More than all of the companions and those after them? Obviously not. Are you more knowledgeable than them? Where do you get this act from? Also we find that in these type of, of, of celebrations of milads or mawlids, we find that many times men and women come together. Many times the Prophet ﷺ is praised beyond what Allah has given him, the status. That he's attributed that he knows everything or that he forgives. And these are characteristics that only Allah is worthy of. Many times we find a lot of other evils going on here. Where did this practice start from? Uh, if you can give me Al-Khitat Al-Makhrizi, this is a book of history, which was written by Ahmad ibn Ali Al-Makhrizi, who died in the year 845 Hijri. Volume number two, please. Uh, and in this book, he compiled the history of the previous nations. And of what he compiled was the history of the Fatimids, who were an, an empire of uh, evil people, who were extreme fanatics, and they were not in fact even Muslims. Because when Salahuddin, Saladin, Salahuddin, when he was fighting the Crusades, he said, if I go attack the Christians, this dynasty, the Fatimids, will attack me. So I have to destroy them and then go attack the Christians. That's how evil they were. And he, and he destroyed them. This person, he narrated the customs and traditions of the Fatimid dynasty. And of them was, they were the ones who celebrated the Prophet's birthday. And they celebrated Nowruz, which is the day that the fire worshippers celebrate, and they celebrated Christmas, 25th of December. These were the people who died or roughly in the year 400 Hijrah. They are the ones who introduced this concept of Milad. Before this incident, before this book, you do not find it mentioned. None of the companions, none of the famous Imams ever celebrated it. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed, no one ever did it. Where did it come from? This extreme, radical dynasty who were not even Muslim. My dear brothers and sisters, we have traveled far and wide in our search of the fundamentals of faith. We have discussed many issues of La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah. Yet we can conclude the entire episodes that we have done in two simple statements. Two very easy principles of Islam. Our religion of Islam is based upon these two principles and that is it. The first principle is that Allah Azza wa Jal is that Allah and only Allah is worthy of our worship. And the second principle is that that worship must be based upon the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the religion of Islam, that's it. All that we have discussed goes around these two points. That there is only one deity that is worthy of worship and that is Allah. And there is only one methodology to accomplish that worship and that is the methodology of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the proof for this? What is the proof for this? The testimony of faith that every Muslim says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. With this we conclude our first series of episodes of Fundamentals of Faith. Everything that I have said that is correct 
is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and anything that I've said that is incorrect is from me and from the whisperings of shaitan and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives me and that he guides all of us to the truth to the pure worship of Allah based upon the sunnah of the messenger of Allah subhanak Allah wa hamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh